All right, there's the tech order. Has everybody got the tech order up? Anybody not have the tech order up? A better way of saying it and asking it. Who does not have this tech order up? All right, let's go through it then. Now, what I'm trying to show you is the highlighted areas, and I have them highlighted, and we'll explain them why they're highlighted. What the heck? Wrong one. I apologize. That was bad on me. I have a highlighted one. So much easier. To see. There we go. So the first place that we are going to look at is Chapter 1 General Information. There is uh, some descriptions. You got purpose of the equipment on 1.2, and then there's, there's equipment description on 1.3, gives you an overview of what it is. And you'll notice that in that sentence it says the Jerk 239 is complete, lightweight, full duplex FM frequency modulation, microwave, line of sight radio system that can be set up, can be quickly set up to interconnect, so forth and so on. What they're talking about with either multiplexing equipment or satellite terminals. When I go up to 1.3, dot one types of traffic this is the aggregate that it can handle most of this stuff needs to be a three volt peak to peak but normally what comes out of a multiplexer might be five volts peak to peak you're going to see and we're going to go through this in the signal flow there is an attenuator to get it to lower to three volts peak to peak the first one says 3 volt peak to peak condition die phase, that's CDI. And then it goes through and tells you from 0.072 to 4.608 megabits per second. And then it says, it talks about the analog or digital voice or wire, that's our channel, that's maintenance channel. The next part of where I have highlighted in 1.3.1 it says radio set jerk 239 can carry a 6.144 megabits per second the word pseudo NRZ is in here listen to what I have to tell you on this this is the only place in the tech order that you will ever see the word pseudo with NRZ. It's assuming that you read this part, that the rest of the TO, anytime it says NRZ, it's referencing pseudo NRZ. Let me explain why this is the only place. Well, you got to understand this was built in the late 80s, early 90s. Back then, they didn't have digital content. They had paper tech orders. All right, Botkin, I'll wait on you. Okay, I thought you were writing. Anyway, the way companies save money is if they can eliminate one word, one word, they can save themselves like a page. Now, what does that mean to a company? It means that if I got to print out a thousand of these tech orders, one page times a thousand could equal out to a thousand dollars. Why? Because back then, printing out tech orders was a costly affair. So that's the reason why you will only see the word pseudo in anywhere else in the TO. That's the only place you're going to see it. Now, we did call the company and ask them why that was, and that, that was what they told us. 
So nowadays, with the advent of digital content, you need to change something in the TO. It's just a matter of going in, clicking on, let's just say, this is a, an Adobe file. So click on it, change it, save it, and then send it out to everybody as an update. All right, so we look at 3.2, or excuse me, 1.3.2 typical deployments. This is just a highlighting some information on there. We go to 1.3.3, and one of the things that I point out on this one is that first highlighted region where it says separated, you know, because you can take the separate units. In other words, if you look above me, there's a tisser. That's the Jerk 239. There are two sub there are two assemblies on there. One is the RF, one is the baseband. Well, what they're telling you in this particular highlighted area is you can put them on a tripod and use what's called a two foot cable on it to connect both the baseband and the RF assembly. Or you can use a hundred and fifty foot of supplied cable that comes with it and separate them out. The next part of that highlighted area shows that you've got 70 megahertz intermediate frequency, just to show you that we are, you know, trying to lead you down that straight and narrow path. The bottom part of that radiation talks about a one or two foot diameter antenna. Now, they're talking about the dish, not the actual antenna, but they classify it as part of the antenna. So you look at it, you can also see that it goes either horizontal or vertical polarization. Remember I said that back in uh, that, what is it, one alpha, we that I would reference the diversity system right there is part of it. We'll get into that later. Oh look, it can be put on a mast and that's solely the RF assembly. You cannot put the baseband on it. I think the RF assembly is approximately 18 pounds and I know people probably had some trouble lifting the AT197 up, didn't they? So when you get that one, that's a lot of upper body strength that you've got to do lifting. Now, the one thing that's unique about this is it has an extra set of guy ropes compared to the other uh, mast. Now, there's two different types, and if you hadn't noticed it in Block 4, we have a CTM-15 mast, and if you look closely, you had a Jerk-239 mast. Okay, and you're going, well, oh, I didn't see it. Well, it's normally a little placard on the uh, front where the handle is, and it would tell you whether it's a CTM or it's a Jerk-239. You know, well, shouldn't it be with the tisser? Well, yeah, but we don't practice putting the tisser on it when we get to the tisser lab. That would be kind of rough, so to speak. So instead of taking eight days, it would probably take nine days. You guys want to get out of here early, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. So the next section is 1.4 where it says equipment configurations. This is showing you the one and two foot dish and what it gets applied with. Now when you're looking at the one foot dish on 1.4 in parentheses two, that's the first highlighted, it says deployed with a one foot diameter antenna attached to the RF assembly atop a 50 foot mass. What does that mean? It means that you can only put the RF assembly with the one foot dish on top of it. The tisser comes with two dishes. One's a one foot, one's a two foot. You don't want to put the two foot on the RF assembly when you put it on the mass 
because it acts like a sale. In other words, that $10,000 mass will get broke. And it's about $1,000 per piece to get replaced. Number three says you can deploy it with a one or two foot diameter antenna attached a tripod. Tripod's right above me. Then in number four says when deployed with a one or two foot diameter antenna attached to an RF, attached to an RF assembly on a pole mount. Poles are very rigid, but you also are using a cherry picker or you have climbing gear to go up that pole. So that way if you put the two foot dish on there, it's not going to break the pole. It'll probably come down before the uh, actual pole will break. All right, this is a picture of what we call the RF baseband assembly case. This is a metal case, and while I've got you here and try to explain it, all three cases that you guys are going to be touching within the next couple of days is a two-person lift. Heed that warning. If you're lifting up the RF and baseband assembly, it's approximately 55 pounds, I think. And it is, you know, if you got to bend down and lift, it is an awkward piece. So therefore, you run the risk of injuring your back. That's the reason why it'll say, on the sides, it'll say, two-person lift. In here, you can see number one and number two. That's the RF assembly on the left side and the baseband assembly on the right side. This is all within the case. They can be removed and either put on. You guys are probably going to be putting it on a tripod. You'll see that number five is our handset. Uh, two, three. There it is. Four is our two foot jumper cable. Six is our power cord. And seven is the headset. Handset goes to the baseband assembly. Hand, excuse me, headset goes to the RF assembly. Handset goes to the baseband assembly. I got it right. Now, when you fold this case up, this is the side view. All of your accessories are on number eight. You just pop the case off and you can pull all the cables out. This is the, what I call the dish case. The transit case so on when you lift the lid up you will see the two foot in there it's retained by some uh, velcro and then on the bottom side you will see the two wave guides you've got the short one and the long one the short one goes with the one foot the long one goes with the two foot number four is the one foot dish Five is all the other accessories, things like that go to the CTM, or in our case, the mast. You're going to have two sets of cables, a whole bunch of two-foot stakes, not to be confused with the one-and-a-half-foot ones that we have in Block 4. And there's also some other accessories in there. One is for the... Uh, what is it? The mounting for the RF assembly that goes into the CTM. And here you go. Number six says it's the antenna tilt assembly. That uh, device, bottom right hand side, that looks kind of like a uh, gear mechanism. Tripod. You will have that tripod case. Comes with the uh, pan and tilt assembly as well as the mounting plate you have the tripod and number five whatever you do don't lose that if you lose that it's hard as heck to put it back together or take it apart 
This is the mast using the 150 foot cable. And this is the tripod with the tisser on it itself. That's the RF assembly, one foot diameter, two foot diameter antenna. This is the baseband assembly. We've got colored versions, which makes it a lot easier. Now, I just wanted to point this part out for GWIZ information 1.5.2 mast. And the highlighted region says the mast is capable of supporting the Jerk 239 RF assembly with the one foot diameter antenna in wind speeds up to 70 miles an hour. Okay, 70. When you look at the CTM, you don't want to put it up if the winds are gusting any more than 20, and that's because you only have three sets of guy ropes on there. This one has four, and they're put in different uh, sections, and it's more stable. Now here you go. This, these are leading particulars, table 1-1, one -one, and you can see the weight. Let's see here. Let's see if we can find the RF assembly is 16 and a half pounds. Can you imagine putting the baseband assembly on there too? At 28.6 pounds? Good grief. That's what the uh, 40 some odd pounds that you're trying to lift on top of the mast? That's just ridiculous. A lot of upper body strength for that one. Let's go to 1.7 capabilities and limitations. This is where you're going to find a lot of information about or the beginning parts of this information on the actual system itself. So you can see that we got the radio set 239 shows you the freak range and the output power. Then you have the RF assembly. It shows you the freak range, the output power, and the IF frequency. When you look at baseband, you can see that we, I'm targeting the uh, receive, which is the, excuse me, that's the transmit where it says input level, and then receive this one down here also talking about the attenuation level and then it has the antennas i like this one too i forgot wow so this is what we do and whenever you need to know general information about your system so you have the rf assembly baseband assembly and the antennas now let's look at the antennas they're parabolic dishes you can see that we have 31 dB of gain. Underneath of it, it shows that nominal distance maximum. I'm pointing this out because the equipment that we have, it comes from the UK. Yeah, UK. You will see that it says that sign in front of the 10 miles, it says less than 10 miles or 16 kilometers. So 16 kilometers is actually less than 10 miles. If you're looking at the two foot parabolic at 37 dBm, it says it's less than 25 miles or 40 kilometers. So you got the Im imperial uh, measurement and then you have the metric measurement. Here is equipment supplied. You can see that the two foot jumper cable comes with it. You got a head, headset, handset, and power cord. And while I'm thinking of it, I'll just go ahead and pre-warn you with this. There will be a section when you're doing your checks with the tisser. Some of you will think that the headset is pretty cool and we'll put it on. I'll guarantee you the moment that you get to doing the test tone you'll be ripping that headset off your uh, head there. Why? Because there is no volume control 
for the test tone that goes to the, either the head set or hand set. So this is a safety tip. When you connect these two up, just put them on top of the Jerk 239. You can see above me that there's space to where you can put both the headset and the handset. So the only place that it has a volume control, this is for your speaker that's on there. And it's on the baseband assembly. I know I'm probably making your head spin. Uh, this is to show you through, we've got that cable reel, 150 foot, connects the RF assembly with the baseband. And we will be talking about that. Sub assemblies, go down further. Again, showing you two foot cable. Installation procedures. Now, I highlighted this one to show you that there will be differences when you get into block 10 versus what we do in block 7 here, or whatever the new blocks are. I think it's 8 and 11. This is showing you that it's going most, most configurations will be a minimum crew of two persons is mandatory. Now, one person can accomplish the entire installation of the Jerk 239s. And it says, for installations utilizing tripod assembly, one person. For installations employing the mass, a minimum of two. Got that. But most can be set up with when you're dealing with the mass, it's easier if you do three or four. Now, I showed you where it says a tripod is one man hour. And what they're talking about is hey, you have one hour to get this set up and checked out. In other words, connected, got mission traffic flowing. Because we don't have a multiplexer and we don't have any of the other stuff that attaches to it, you're going to have 45 minutes max. And that's for both of you to set it up a grand total of two on one end and two on the other end. You guys should be able to do it, but then I think Mr. Miller has the record for one of his classes that had it up and operational in seven minutes. That's that's pretty good. It's doing all the checks, well, installing it, doing all the checks, and ready to flip it in a, what's called operate. Now, you you can imagine that you guys are on, you know, twos and you know, two on one end, two on the other. The first time you do this, you're probably going to take every bit of 45 minutes to an hour. Take your time. Then you can practice to get faster. When you get to block 10, you will have 15 minutes to set it up. You will have one person on one end and one person on the other end. You won't have two and two. Well, why is that? Well, before you deploy out to block 10 area or block 11, whatever it's called now, you're going to take that and you're going to set up in the hallway and you're going to go through all the checks. You're going to input your frequencies, make sure everything is working, and then pack it up. So when you go out to the area, the AEF area, and they say go, you have 15 minutes. One person should be able to set up the tripod, put everything on it, fire it up. It's ready to go. You don't have to do any checks. Why? You did them back in the hallway. Okay? Everything is entered in. Everything's been checked out. Now, there are problems, which you're probably going to have to figure out. If you get out there and nothing is working, yeah, now you got to troubleshoot it. Normally, when you have something like that, you're probably going to have mm, probably about five, six minutes. You're all going to have that set up, ready to go. Most people I've seen out there have it done in that time. It's pretty quick. Uh, again, this is that antenna tilt assembly. Uh, it comes with a halyard. Now, halyard's going to do the uh, tilting. Why? Because there is that azimuthal, but most of the time you're already going to have that set up. You can 
actually use the top part of the mast with the guy ropes and twist it just a little bit to get it in sync. You know, bye bye bye. No? Okay. All right. That's uh, more typical mass stuff. Get to the juicy part here. Let's let's. Uh, again, they're saying insta installation tripod mount comes with the one or two foot. Again, the two foot jumper. It's all over the place. I will eventually get somebody that will tell me I can't find it. All right, number four is operate. Chapter four is operation. Now, with this one, we have a extract that we are going to give you. We will have a cut sheet that will tell you the frequencies and what the waveguide will be put in, either vertical or horizontal polarization. And if you really understand the meat and potatoes of it you'll you'll notice that on one end it, it, it'll say let's say vertical and then on the other end it'll say horizontal there's that polarization diversity so you when you look at this I'm the reason why I highlighted Charlie it says rotate the four transmitter frequency thumb wheel switch to the desired transmit frequency when uh, you get the cut sheet and the tech order says put in your operation frequencies, it'll give you a transmit and receive. Most of you will, I've seen this happen, skip that step. And then you wonder why your tisser doesn't work. Read all the steps. The next one I want to point out is table 4-1. This is extremely important. Why? Because it tells you everything that's on, in our case, the RF assembly. Everything that those switches does, the meter, uh, you know, every one of those dials. So I come to number three and number four where it says transmitter and receiver on it. The highlighted part says... Our frequency range, let me give you the background. Our frequency range is 14.4 to 15.25 gigahertz. We're going to start with the far left hand side saying the 10,000 units, which is the one. You will only see a screen in or screen printed one on the far left hand side. Now, why is that? You don't need to change the one. Why? Because our frequency range is 14.4 and 15.25. The tens of gigahertz don't change. They don't. In our case, it says 10,000 megahertz. Same thing. The second number from the left, the, f the ones of gigahertz, will only be switched to a 4 or a 5. If you can switch it to a 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, thumb wheels broke. There is a, what do you call those things, a lockdown uh, pin that you can only switch it between four and five. If you can get it to six, that pin has been broken. It's, it shouldn't go outside the four or the five. Now the rest of them, the next two numbers over there, uh, or three numbers I think, you can change to whatever. Now you'll notice that it says uh, this prevents accidental setting outside the frequency range of the system. If an invalid frequency is chosen, lower than 14.4 or higher than 15.25 the channel error indicator will be illuminated as well as the summary alarm see what I mean about you know when things go wrong there is things that will pop up and tell you hey there's a problem here 
This also does it down in the transmitter frequency, number four. Number six and number seven tells you pretty much what could be wrong when it's lit or when, in our case, we want it not to light up. But it only gives you the, the, the indication when there isn't a problem. We have the baseband assembly controls and indicators. Again, there is a lot on here. And so you can see that it is two tables. It's table 4-2 on pages 4-4 and 4-3. Look at the number 12 here that I got illuminated. It says the light illuminates when a system fault is detected in operate or standby modes in either the RF assembly or baseband assembly. Light flashes at a 2 hertz rate during normal operation mode in standby mode. It's extinguished if everything is working when you flip it in the operate. Let me explain those two modes for you. Operate means that you're transmitting out and receiving. Standby means that you are no longer transmitting or receiving through the antenna. You are doing something called loopback. So with the summary alarm when everything is normal and you're in standby, what will happen is, is when you turn the power on, the standby light will stay illuminated for about 10 seconds because it's going through its checks. After about those 10 seconds, it will start blinking at a 2 hertz rate. If it stays solid for any more than 10, 15 seconds, you have a problem. You have a problem. So you can see that we've got a lot of relationship for Chapter 4, even though it's operation, but it does go through all of the points. Here is the RF, baseband assembly, not the RF. And you can see every one of the numbers will match what's in the table. And this is what you guys will be doing, let's see, what, Thursday and Friday? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now, theory of operation tomorrow. We will be going through it at the 9 o'clock session. We're going to look at transmitter operation. We're going to look at receiver operation, order wire and intercom loop back, and not really testing, but it's just loop back. Gives you an idea of what's going on here. Now, I've highlighted some areas because just wanted to point out that our order wire on 5.2.2.3, we talk about the 8.5 megahertz subcarrier. Right? That is an FM signal that carries or basically is modulated order wire. In other words, that's our channel. You can see that we have the transmitter operation. We have a diagram that comes with it, both the transmitter baseband and the transmitter RF assembly. We'll go through each one of those tomorrow. And then we have the receiver operation. And you can see that I got a few of those places highlighted. It talks about the filters, the local oscillators, Again, showing you some of this digital traffic that we're going to talk about. Every bit of what we are going to go through tomorrow will be covered, and it's in this tech order. The receiver section also comes with its own set of schematics. You'll notice the bold lines. That's how we're going to follow everything is through those bold lines. We have something called order wire operation and this is where it shows you that the 8.5 megahertz is an frequency modulated signal FM it doesn't say frequency modulates it says frequency modulates <laughs> same thing so you, you might find some of this stuff that looks similar to what we're looking for just to ask the question 
Again, uh, this is going back through loopback test is on another one. So every one of these, those four that we just talked about, is going to be covered in the signal flow diagram. Let's go to our handy dandy light show. Any questions on the tech order? No, sir. It's pretty straightforward. There may be some instances where you might be confused, so when you reach those points, please ask. Please ask. All right. Number four, Charlie. Identify basic facts about the characteristics of the Tropo Satellite Support Radio, better known as a Tisser, interchangeable with the Jerk 239. Take a look at these. Yep, you're going to be playing with that monstrosity. Now, out in the field, they're slowly but surely getting rid of them. They're trying to get the new product, which we now have. It's called the P2P. 600 or P2P 700. It's point to point. 600 and 700 are the models. The difference between this one and the other is it can handle more traffic and, and it can go farther. But we still have the Tisser out in the field. Again, we are the stewards of the taxpayer money. And we have to make these things last as long as we can. Now, the UTCs for that is slowly but surely going away, and they're using the new products. But they still have to be on standby to support. We're going to look at purpose, operating characteristics, types of traffic, and equipment, and we're going to stop right at signal flow. So purpose, I showed you earlier where that was at, it's in chapter one. It is a full duplex radio. Lightweight and field tunable, that's up for discussion on lightweight. It does, it is used for quick deployments, three cases for each tisser, and they normally come in pairs. The nice thing is, is you connect it to your multiplexer and voila, you're good to go. The idea behind the tisser is to make sure that you don't have to dig a couple miles. Frequency range is 14.4 to 15.25 gig. Power output just from the RF assembly, just from the RF assembly, is 25 dBm. But when you add the different dishes to them, they go up. The IF frequency is 70 megahertz. The max range is less than 25 miles or 40 kilometers. Types of traffic. We have CDI and pseudo NRZ as well as your analog or digital voice order wire. Again, I showed you in chapter 3. That last one was in 1.3.1, I think. The equipment, there are two assemblies. One is the baseband assembly. The other one is the RF assembly. They are separate. They can be put together on a tripod. They can be separate when it comes to putting it on a pole and a mast. Remember, you got the 150-foot cable. I don't know who your instructor is going to be for your labs, but at the same time, they may decide that you are going to use the 150 foot cable just to give you an idea how it's going to work. Baseband assembly just goes to show you some places that you could place it. Same with the RF assembly, 50 foot mass, tripod, and pole. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough the 50 foot mass only will use the one foot dish, not the two foot. This is the baseband assembly. It contains five LRUs. That's line replaceable units. 
You can see we got five up here, order wire, transmitter, baseband, breaker panel, and power supply. When you look at the picture, you only see four. The breaker panel and the power supply are in the same area. So if you were to go to the far right, look at the power button and the bottom switch, you got four screws, pull it out, you'll have a circuit card, and on the side will be your power supply. So you can access it. Now, when you are doing the operational, you're going to find quick find out very quickly that the power on and off switch guarantee that one of you will will make this happen is when it says turn the power on. There's a lot of resistance behind that switch. Why? Think of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Think of it as your breaker panels, like you trip the breaker in your house and you got to go turn it off and turn it back on. There's a lot of resistance to it. That's what this does. It acts just like it. Get it? The breaker panel. That's what that switch does. So if you don't, you know, give some force behind it, it will trip. So you got to turn it back off and turn it back on again. And especially you got to use force to get it to turn on. When the light illuminates, then you know you're good. And it stays in the up position. We have the RF assembly. There is two, or excuse me, three line replaceable units. All of them are behind that front panel. If you unscrew the four screws there, the panel will uh, is on a hinge. Open it up. All the, the three cards are right there. You can use a one or two foot antenna with this, de depending on the situation. Again, the one foot can only go on the mast. The two foot can go on the pole or the tripod. You can use the, either the two foot or the 150 foot cable. And to be quite honest with you, I would never use the 150 foot cable when they're on the tripod. Doesn't make any sense. Use the two foot one. You'll notice this last one down here. It says transmit and receive must be 200 megahertz apart. That's your frequency diversity. Okay, frequency diversity. And the reason why it's 200 megahertz apart, if they were close to each other, they would interfere with each other. That's the reason why they got to be at least 200 megahertz apart. With the FM and the amount of bandwidth that is needed to transmit the multiplexer's information back and forth, if it wasn't too high, I, if it wasn't 200 megahertz apart, you're going to have some major issues. Normally, they want, they want a little bit more than 200 megahertz apart. Again, this is one of those, if you get out in the field, you're not going to determine the frequencies. Oh, no. Someone else is going to make that determination because they did the research of where you're being deployed, and they're going to give you those frequencies to put in. So there shouldn't be any errors at that point. This is showing you the two antennas or two dishes that comes with it. You got the one foot and the two foot. Just remember the one foot is 31 dB of gain, can be mounted with the, on the RF assembly with the tripod polar mast. However, the two foot can only be on the tripod or pole only, and it's 37 dB of gain. Again, this can be found in chapter one on its capabilities and limitations. We are at signal flow. Okay. Is there any questions on what we just went over? It's a lot of information, isn't it?